How's it going 3D printers? Andrew Sink here, and in this video I'm going to be unboxing and sharing my first thoughts on the Mingda Rock 3 3D printer. This isn't a full review video, more of a first impressions, and I plan on doing some more videos with this machine in the future. The Mingda Rock 3 is a large volume FDM 3D printer, with a build platform that's slightly larger than a CR10 at 320 by 320 by 400 millimeters. It also has a number of hardware upgrades typically found on more expensive machines, like dual-Z lead screws, a filament runout sensor, heated build platform, and a direct drive BMG clone extruder. Unboxing and assembling the printer is a really straightforward affair. It took me about an hour and a half and I didn't run into any major obstacles. The printer ships with all the hardware and tools you need for assembly, as well as a few extras like spare nozzles, PTFE couplers, and things like that. At 320 millimeters squared, the build volume on the Rock 3 is definitely on the large side for an FDM printer, and you can see a comparison to a standard Prusa Mark III build platform here. The physical assembly process of the Rock 3 is really easy, just like the D2. There's covers that go over most of the motion components, and the extruder has three bolts that hold it in place. The Rock 3 comes pre-wired from the factory. There's only a few electrical connections, like the Z-axis and some of the end stops, that need to be connected before you can get the printer up and running. The gantry also arrives largely pre-assembled. All you have to really do is attach the frame to the base and use two T-brackets to hold them together. The Rock 3 uses a Bontech BMG style extruder as well as a cloned E3D hot end with a Mark 8 nozzle. It's kind of a strange configuration, but it works really well for direct drive on this machine. I prefer this extruder setup to the extruder setup on the Mingda D2 because this is a little bit more accessible and it's easier to disassemble if you have a filament jam or clog. It's also a relatively lightweight solution, so you can get faster print speeds without swinging a lot of mass back and forth on the x-axis. The color touchscreen is intuitive and easy to use, and allows you to adjust the heat of the hot end, the build plate, and also adjust the baby stepping of the Z height during a print. This is great if your printer is a little out of calibration and you don't necessarily want to restart the entire print. I used one of the included G-code files as a test print, and just like on the Mingda D2, the included files take almost 12 hours to print, so if you're looking just to test out the machine, I'd probably recommend skipping these and just slicing a file and printing it on your own. Just like the Mingda D2, the removable magnetic mat makes removing prints really easy. They just peel right off, and you can see the surface finish on this printed demo part looks pretty good. The only downside is this very visible seam on the model. This is a direct result of the way the file was sliced. You can see the extruder actually reverses direction after finishing each layer, so it takes a lot longer than if it just moved in one continuous motion. The result is a model that has a clearly visible seam, but putting that aside, the overall quality of the vase looks pretty good, and I'm happy with the quality of the print. The Mingda Rock 3 comes with a version of Repetier Host included on the SD card for slicing models and controlling the printer. I'm not a big fan of Repetier Host, I thought it looked kind of clunky the first time I used it back in 2012, and I still think that now. Instead, I decided to make a profile in Prusa Slicer for this machine, but instead of designing it from scratch, I used the walkthrough provided by Tom Sandlaterer, which is an awesome way to take a Mark III-S profile and bring over some of the tips and tricks that machine uses over to a third-party printer. This was a fast way to build a profile, and I didn't have to enter a lot of the values manually. I used the Apollo Astronaut as a test print. It's kind of a funky print in that it prints upside down and it has pre-generated support built into it, so there's no support material needed for this model. It's kind of a good test to see how a printer handles a real challenge, and overall I was pretty happy with the way it came out. There was a little bit of stringing on the back of the model, but generally speaking the overall surface quality was pretty good. Because the Rock 3 is a direct drive extruder, I didn't have to play around with the Z-Hop or attraction values, I just used the defaults that came with Prusa Slicer for the Mark 3S and went from there. There's a little bit of Z-banding present, and some of the layers look a little bit uneven, but that's kind of nitpicky for a first print. Generally speaking, I'm pretty satisfied with the way it worked, and I'm happy with the way the print came out. Because the Rock 3 is advertised as a large volume printer, I wanted to test it out with a print that would be a little bit more of a challenge in terms of volume. So I printed the bottom half of my Oskitone keyboard case, which is a 3D printed synth, you can see it in this video here. And at 160 by 190 millimeters, it's a pretty large print, so it's a good test of bed adhesion and overall flatness. The silk PLA that I used stuck to the magnetic base without any problems, and I used the baby stepping feature to adjust the Z height on the fly just to make sure all four corners were even, and overall I'm really impressed with the way the model sticks to this platform. I really like this style of print surface because models tend to snap right off when you're finished and all you have to do is flex the plate. So here's the finished product. 
You can see a little bit of rippling on the back from before I adjusted the Z height, but generally speaking, a large flat part like this tends to be a challenge to print, but on the Rock 3, I was able to get it done on the first print. One of the issues I ran into when printing with the Rock 3 was the placement of the filament runout sensor. The filament runout sensor is actually placed behind the extruder on the Y axis, so as you start to increase in Z height, the filament has to make an almost 90 degree turn to get to the extruder. This picture was taken with the X gantry raised all the way to the 400mm point, and you can see it's actually above the filament runout sensor. This means for long, tall prints, you'll need to either bypass or disable the filament runout sensor, or move it to a different place on the printer. It's kind of a strange design choice, but really it's the only major problem I ran into when setting the machine up. Overall, as a hardware solution, I'm really impressed with the ROC 3. It's similar to the D2 in that it offers a lot of high-end features on a fairly low-cost machine. If you're printing large parts or need to print many small parts, this machine might be a pretty good fit for you. As always, thanks for watching and have fun printing!